So it's seventy dollars and some persistence. I made five million dollars in just under a month. Flex Lewis, you're straight out the lair. Today's guest is an entrepreneur with an incredible story. From a childhood of poverty, Section 8 housing and abuse to creating a multi-million dollar empire. We talk about overcoming challenges, creating wealth, building culture, and rebuilding after catastrophe. His resume transcends many sectors from construction, retail, marketing, to real estate, and venture capital. In this episode, he reveals the skill sets that are needed to be successful and specific strategies to turn very little money into millions, all while keeping a moral and ethical life of integrity. Here's a podcast with my friend, Derek Fay. I was sued because a man told me at the gyms that his, I was responsible for breaking his wife's vagina. <laughs> this is a true story. And I argued with the man. That I couldn't have possibly broken your wife's vagina. Yeah. I think she may have bruised her pelvic bone. This motherfucker was like in tears that his wife's vagina had been broken. And so it went to a, a full-blown lawsuit. And the punchline is, I know the street value of a vagina because I paid $12,000 for a broken one. This ain't no joke. Well, this is a legit lawsuit. Well, the lady got on a spin bike, slipped, and hit the crossbars, hit her pelvic bone. So she convinced her husband that her vagina was broken, probably because she didn't want to sleep with him. Oh my God! <laughs> so, this anyway, thing, this is this is the opening for the podcast. So, so can, live can I say vagina on the podcast? We're already live. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> so there, there you go. I mean, I've got like eight hundred other terms I could use. Let's go. <laughs> but we go. But we're live, right? My man, Derek Faye, straight out the lair. Welcome, my friend. It's been a minute trying to get you here, but uh, you got in late last night. I did. You had some travels um, all the way from Naples, Florida. And uh, yes, so I will say this for the for the viewers, as uh, most people know, we are building the studio next door, and we have had many conversations about getting you on the podcast. And I was the one who was saying, "Listen, let's just wait, let's just wait, let's just wait." <laughs> and in the end, you said, "Flex, we can do part two, three, four. <laughs> let's just knock this out, get it done." And I said, "You know what? Let's go." So here we are. No. Um, you are in town because obviously you're you're. You're not in Vegas for, for what most people fly in Vegas for. Every time you come into town, you have got some big business rollout, <laughs> the, a podcast, something. You're, you're a man of, uh, well, you're, you're a man in the go, that's for sure. And one thing that you and I connected over was the love for the gym. Yes. And also the ultra, entrepreneurial store the other I know of you from literally nothing the self-made success story is what i gravitate to as most people know watching this podcast i love that story um you're certainly not anybody that's been handed anything on a silver tray you are um an entrepreneur from the get-go from a very young age um and uh again I, I want to get into so many different sectors but you've also lived a lot of different lives as well as yeah. you know and again i don't know how much we are able to talk about on the podcast but um let's just take it back to you know i say to the the entrepreneurial beginning sure um on how you got that mindset which is obviously transitioned into now you owning multiple businesses scaling multi-million dollar businesses um and obviously having a portfolio that is so impressive which i want you to talk about humbly which i know you uh, if i have to get these numbers squeezed out to you then i will say the numbers <laughs> you but, might have to squeeze them but from the beginning let, let, let's talk uh, about your humble beginnings go from the beginning yeah so i grew up in the smallest town in the smallest state in the country uh north kingstown rhode island most people don't even know where rhode island is i like to say it's near new york although it really isn't um i grew up in um Section 8 housing, uh, welfare, single mom, whole deal. Um, you know, at a very young age, uh, my, my biggest concern was, was there going to be food on the table? And when I talk about things, I always preface that um, I wear that as a badge of honor. I don't wear that as a victim. Um, and I think that's a great place to start because that's really what has shaped my life, my direction, my mindset, everything from as early as I can remember, four or five years old. And, and um, that early childhood, um, was it a good upbringing? Even though you were in Section 8 housing and stuff, was, was it a, a traumatic childhood or was it a good childhood? Um, it was probably one of the most abusive 
um, childhood you could possibly imagine. I mean, horrifically abusive. Yeah. From the age of um, four or five until about 12, my stepfather beat the living shit out of me and my sister and my brother on a, I'm sorry, me, my sister, and my mom on a regular basis. I mean, horrifically. Wow. Yeah. How did that how did that then transition into where you got to? Was it a, did it play a big part in, 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 um, in getting to and molding you into the person you are today? Because would, again, there's, there's two ways you can go and do that, is. right? Yes. So I want to know what, what made you click because a lot of you was obviously have had very similar beginning stories and, and it transitioned into the gym, into, into X, Y, Z. I, I want to know what that, what that story looks like. Yeah. So for some context, um, my brother and my sister, uh, my brother, sorry, my sister went to prison for 12 years. And my brother is currently in prison. So to say that, it, you know, s- statistically speaking, I should be in prison. Um, for me to be sitting here in the life that I have, Hollywood couldn't have written a story more amazing that put Derek Fay here from where Derek Fay was at five, six years old. Um, it changed everything about me as a human being. Mm. Um, you know, again, when you're four or five years old, all the way up till 12, the, you know, your biggest concern in the world is the cartoon, my buddy, the game. Mine was, um, should I take a beating instead of my mother? Um, how am I going to find food for my baby sister? And so that makes you grow up quick. And so for me at a very young age, and I can't tell you exactly why, instead of thinking this was the norm, I can remember very, very vividly, as you tend to in situations like that, while I was taking a horrific beating, beating, the Rhode Island accent came out there. <laughs> when I go back, it comes back. Um, I can remember thinking, this is not right. I don't know exactly what is, but I know that this is not what is right. Mm-hmm. And so I just held on to that. And it took me and my, my baby sister uh, through all of the really hard times. And it changed me as a human being. Now, there's certainly some baggage that comes along with that. Mm-hmm. And if I'm really looking back in reflection... I think that's what took me to the gym. Right. I, well, I, wanted the, I wanted to feel powerful. I wanted to feel in control. I wanted to be able to make sure that no one ever hurt my family again. Uh, and maybe not the healthiest reason, but by getting there, I then found both physical and mental health through the gym. Mm. And it has been a staple in my life for over 30 years. Yeah. What, what age is that when you first walked into the gym? 13. 13. About a month after I found, this is hilarious, my father wouldn't pick up a weight for a million dollars. Someone gave him as a gag gift the Arnold Schwarzenegger like bodybuilding Bible. It was, oh. like, it was like this thick. Of course. And I yeah. found it in the closet, and I opened it, and I saw these men, and it was over for me. Yeah. I would looked at those pictures every single day when I was home, and just, I obsessed on it. Yeah. And it just, it took me to a whole other place. Who was the guys that you were looking at back then? That was like you know, your inspiration that you had on the... Um, so early on, it was always Arnold. And yeah. honestly, to this day, for me, um, no offense, my man, you're my brother, and I love you, you're the king. <laughs> but to me, you know, coming up, he, he changed my life through a book. Yeah. Right? Um, and then as I really got into it, my guys were Ronnie. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie was the next Arnold for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I think for everybody in the space, oh. he came on the scene. It was like, what am I even looking at? What a mutant. And it's then, never going to be anybody like, uh, since. You know, agreed. It's never going to be. Agreed. And then, and I, I did, I've never met him. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've heard stories through people who know him very well. Um, and now I see him in the position that he's in where his body is broken, but his spirit isn't. And so everything I've heard about him, about what a great man he was, how much he actually loved the sport, mm-hmm. was also very compelling for me to, above and beyond what he looked like. Yeah. Yes, Samuel Arnold obviously was the, uh, I would say the... The OG. Yeah. I mean, you know, you growing up, I remember just watching movies and I didn't really know who Arnold was mm-hmm. until later on because I was a kid. Yeah. But you, you know, growing up around all these action, you know, action movies, it's like, Jesus, who is this guy? Yorked out. And subconsciously that played a massive part. Obviously I've said this in many podcasts for me getting to, you know, I guess one step closer to the sport that mm-hmm. I never knew I was going to be into. Right. Um, but um, with, with other guys, Ronnie obviously came later on in my life, but then Ronnie was, you know, the king, um, and I was entering a sport, the end road was and would have been against Ronnie. Right. Because there was no classes. There was no 212 class back then. It was no 202 or whatever. Right. 
So for me, I was looking at Ronnie and was like, man, this is, this is, this is, this is ultimate boss. It's unbelievable. You know? Right. He competed against greats. Oh, that was a Who, if he run. wasn't on the stage, they would have been Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Any no other. question. No question. Flex, Wheeler, Kevin oh Ronnie. I mean, the, the list goes on. The list goes on. You're right. So, so I'm, t- I'm guessing, what would, what you would that be? That you were kind of watching that and into the sport then? When did he win his first Olympia? Because I feel like that was, um, uh, was probably just before. I remember him finishing maybe eighth or something like that. Yeah, he went from last to first. Something like that. So whatever year that was, but I'm thinking that's, what, uh, early 90s? Mid-90s? Tyus, can you find out what Ronnie, what year Ronnie won? Ronnie Coleman, his first Olympia. Um, it just plays a part in the timeline and everything. Yeah. But, so you obviously joined the gym at 13. Ronnie was in the mix at that time. Uh, he wasn't even point. at that time because I was no. 13 years no, old. But, yeah, yeah, but... Um, but he was somebody that later on was, was uh, you know, an inspiration to you at some yeah. capacity. Now, I know that 22, mm-hmm. that's the age that you kind of had your first, uh, or you, start, you started up your company and it blew up, right? Yeah. Prior to that, mm-hmm. where, where was the entrepreneurial mindset? Was it gathering in, in that time frame from 13 to when you first started? I just got 1998. Yeah, and sure. so, so you'll hear me talk all the time about angles. Okay. Angles and leverage. And so let's go back to when I was a kid. And, and what gave me the superhuman power that I have now, superhuman, yeah. meaning I see things, I see opportunity before they arise, yeah. is because as a kid, I had nothing. Yeah. And I was literally searching for any opportunity to grab something for my family. Okay. And so when you do that every day from 5 until 18, you start to pick up on trends and patterns and opportunities. And so my first real, <laughs> my first real enterprise, um, I was uh, in, I think, third grade. And there were these trading cards called <laughs> Garbage Pail Kids. Do you remember these things? <laughs> We've talked talk about it. Oh, my God. Right? Yeah. So, uh, so I was somewhat of an intelligent kid. So I got a scholarship to go to a private school. And so I went the first day and I had these Garbage Pail stickers stuck all over my little book bag or, you know, lunch box. Mm-hmm. Now, these, no offense, but these privileged private school kids had no idea what this is. And you got this guy with his head and his guts pouring out his <laughs> brain. And, and they're like, their brains were like fried. Yeah. It's like, like oh, my, oh, my God. What? I'll, and one kid said, I'll give you a dollar. And I stopped. And I can remember my brain just went, oh, man. man. I bought six of these for 25 cents. So yeah. I took the buck, went and bought four packs. Yeah. And then over the next three months... I just sold these things, a buck, two bucks, three bucks. Wow. And I was making, I mean, 300 bucks a week. Come on. Right. How old are you there? Uh, third grade. What is that? So I'm like eight years old. Wow. Now, I'm still in the projects. Yeah. So I'm bringing money home, you know, stuffed in my <laughs> socks and my lunchbox. And finally they catch on because none of the kids are eating lunch. Mm. So the kids are going home hungry. Well, where's the money? Well, I gave it to little Derek. So, <laughs> so, little instead, Derek. so instead of encouraging little Derek, they said, get the hell out. Kick, oh, they kicked me, kick, kick me right over, out. Over that? Kick me right out. Wow. Yep. Uh, so that was my first enterprise, but I learned a lot of things through that process. Mm. And that's one of the things like, I appreciate about Gary Vee. He, he, he does these things. He gets criticized. Like, oh, go to the, take something out of your house, go to the yard sale, sell it, make a dollar. It's not about that. It's about the process of doing something that you learn so many things. And so so many things or everything that ends up so big starts so small. Yeah. And everybody skips the small stuff looking at the big, but that's the only way to get there. And so that really laid the foundation for yeah. me trading cards at a dollar a pop in fourth grade that that light bulb went off. I love the fact that you said trading cards because um, I was at the Mint not so long ago. Yeah. And I was talking to one of the guys who kind of really had to be involved and he's got a son that... that trades cards and i just watched this little 10 year old mm-hmm. go up to a couple of uh card tradesmen and they were you know this they had their little booths and stuff well not little booths no offense to these guys <laughs> big booth and this kid was hustling mm-hmm. this kid learned how to barter this kid learned how to i'm not giving you this but i'll give you this i'll tell you what right. if you give me this i'll give you this no book can teach you that none nothing and that was what I kind of I, I picked up at a very young age too because again we have got very relatable stories we've we, we've talked way into the nights of <laughs> funny stories very very relatable stories no from two different continents but nonetheless um, tools that you and I have learned in the very beginning when we weren't even looking for That's any right. type of um, you know education education thank you. See, we even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but again, we both have come from very humble beginnings, and that's 
I think that is the core essence of why you and I have connected. Because, Agreed. you know, when you come from very humble beginnings, anything you have is appreciative. That's right. Anybody that you meet that isn't out to Dude. have an MO is appreciated. And, um, again, we've crawled to the top. We, right. We've been, you know, fucked over by a few people too, but we also know who is there and who isn't there. Um, and, again, you've got multiple stories of multiple multi-dollar deals that have gone down, but it all started with cabbage patch kids, right? Garbage, garbage kids. Garbage, garbage, garbage kids. I'm sorry. Cabbage Not patch, cabbage I mean, come on. <laughs> I wasn't trading little dolls. Although, listen, I would have if I if someone offered me money for that. I'd can, have sold can the that damn dolls. Can that be the thumbnail? Can that be the thumbnail? With <laughs> me da- with two garbage da- pill kids and ca- garbage, garbage patch, patch kids. kids. <laughs> yeah, Let's no. Set up the photo shoot. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but nonetheless, my friend, you know that 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 is that is stories again that we we kind of love on the, on the podcast here because I try to never go too far afield from from my core audience and, and yeah. anything that can be learned from this and you know you can go way off the deep end on this which i don't want you to do yeah. i want you to kind of keep within the parameters of um of just you know your storyline and, and how this can motivate the, the 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 viewership that is here so go on, yeah, and, on. And, and so i love that you said that because for me and this is not knocking anybody in particular but you know, so many high-end entrepreneurs, which, by the way, I like the word hustler. Mm. I was a goddamn hustler, and I still am, and just at a higher level. And so people sometimes use big words, and they sling them at you to create distance between what they've done and you. But the truth is, because they don't probably even understand what they've done, or they're full of shit. And so for me, intelligence is being able to take the most complicated thing that you've done, mm. shrinking it into a, um, a message or... A context that someone can hold on to mm-hmm. and then build upon and achieve the same thing. Wow. So let, let's go back to the timeline. You, yep. um, you're still in the gym, you're doing your thing. So I don't know if you want to skip to the, to the part where you and I talked about your, your big breakthrough. Is there anything in between that? Well, there is a very important. Yes, please. And so let's go. This to, is new to me as well. Yeah, yeah. This one is. So uh, at 13, my first gym ever. Um, I'm blocking my face. Yeah, no, we, <laughs> Ty, Ty has just made you a, a, a cabbage patch doll. Uh, tra- Can they see, see it? Yeah, yeah, well, oh, we, we can it. put it on the screen, yeah. Wait, put it over my face. <laughs> see, welcome to Sphere of LA, man. <laughs> we, we keep this just full, don't worry. Oh this, my God. This ain't, uh, ain't Bradley that, podcast. That, that better be the thumbnail. <laughs> no, it's not going to be. We, we need viewers to come. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, okay, so 13, yeah. I walk into my first gym, and this is how meaningful it was to me. I remember the owner's name. Yeah. I remember the name. It was Bodies Unlimited. The guy's name was Donnie Smith. It oh. was a dungeon of a gym. I'm, I'm going to get, I mean, I'm telling yeah. you, when I say a dungeon, I mean pictures of uh, bodybuilders with syringes holding them up. <laughs> Shut up, No, bro. I mean, I mean, hole no. in the wall. Dun- I grew up with weights taped together, guys slinging weights. Like, it was an environment at 13 that you would think, well, wh- how is that healthy? It actually was. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a way that I don't think men and women that don't come from the gym background, will never understand. And so, why it was a pivotal moment for me. It's how I became what I called an intermediary venture capitalist, Ooh. which I love. Sounds so important. It sounds great. It doesn't even exist. <laughs> I made it up. Okay? So, I'm at I the use gym. it too. You should. I'll use it with my wife. Sorry. I'm going to put it on your business card. Yeah. <laughs> intermediary VC. <laughs> Flex. <laughs> uh, okay, so small hole in the wall gym. Now, back then, gyms would do these kind of things where uh, lifetime membership, $100. Mm. They collect a bunch of money, close down overnight. Now, that's not what he was doing, but the point of reference is gyms close down overnight very, very frequently. Yeah. So Donnie came to me because I was there every day just taken in the environment. Um, and he said, Derek, uh, call me D, uh, D, Big D. I was little, right? Big D. Uh, we're closing down in a couple of days. Really sorry. And I was devastated. So I just asked why. And he said, well, we're three months behind on rent. Mm. And he said a number that at that time seemed huge to me, $6,000. So I left, two grand a month. Jeez. So I left. And again, angles, leverage. Instead of leaving upset, which this is a lesson here, instead of leaving upset and beaten, I... F- uber focused on how could I find $6,000? Wow. And so at the time I said, who was the richest man that I know? And in my mind, it was a guy that had a BMW at the gym, richest man I'd ever seen in my life. So I went to him and I said, Hey, the gym's closing down. And he goes, well, why? And I said, well, Donnie needs $6,000. Before I could finish, he goes, tell him I'll give it to him. 
And I was like, I'm so excited. I'm running to the gym. I saved the gym. And I said, Donnie, I got $6,000. John said to put the money in, and this is where it all changed for me. He said, Derek, you've saved the gym. You're never going to pay a gym membership again. You can have anything you want at the gym. If it's closed, I'll give you a key. And the light bulb went off. Mm. I said, okay, so wait. If I can find someone that has money and pair them with someone that doesn't, I can get something for me. Wow. Game changed. So from there on, I started looking for those opportunities. And it started small. Mm. 100 bucks, 500 bucks. Then I'm in my late teens. 5,000 bucks. Then it became 100,000. Then it was 500,000. Then it was a million. And by 22, I'm a liquid multimillionaire. I dropped the intermediary and I started, I started doing what I did. I, I launched 3F Management and, and off to the races. Had a real big win that I told you about, which we can get into. Um, but that kind of gets us up to where it started to really get interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could, you can pop the cherry if you want and, and go with a big win if yeah. you want. It's a great story, yeah. I think, for yeah. the viewers. Yeah. So, first big uh, win, very similar situation. I moved my ass to Florida because I'm done with Rhode Island. It's cold, it's dark, it's gray. No one has aspirations of anything other than staying right where they are. So I got out of Dodge, uh, came to Fort Myers, and I knew what I think everyone either knows or needs to know, that if you want to be successful, you need to meet as many people as possible. Of every shape, size, creed, doesn't matter. The more you meet, the more you make. That's just a fact of life, still mm. today. And so I went about it. And so two of the people that I met were, the, at the time, the most successful realtors uh, in the state of Florida for the largest real estate company, now defunct. And I, I told them a little bit of my history, and they said, let's go to lunch. And so on the way to lunch in Naples, Florida, uh, they get a phone call. And they said, hey, Derek, do you mind if we stop somewhere? Of course, no problem. So they stop at a condo complex, about 300 and, again, I tell this story, the ballpark, about 350 units. And the owner there is saying, here's what we're going to do. We're going to convert all of the units from rentals to high-end condominiums. And there's probably about $150,000 in profit in each. How many do you want for your clients? How many do you want for your clients? And they're signing up, essentially stealing these units from the people because they're going to raise the rents. They're going to wait them out. They're going to push them out. I get in the car, and I ask my two friends, do you have any interest in this project? Nah, we, we deal in multi-million dollar homes. We have no interest. Okay, we go to lunch, come back, do a little research, find out that 20 years ago, generally speaking, when that happens, the tenant has first right of refusal. Now, what do I do? 22 years old. I draft letters. Hey, Mr. Tenant, great news. No, they're not supposed to know, but they should have. Here's what I know. Your tenant, your building, your unit is going to be converted to a high-end condominium. There's going to be a ton of opportunity for you. You have first right of refusal. I highly suggest you buy the unit in benefit. However, if you do not, I would love for you to sign over your rights to me, and I'll give you $1,000 to relocate. And I spent $70 to courier these to the doors. Now, courier is important because knock on the door, Mr. Jones, here's a certified letter so that they open them. Mm. Two, three days goes by. Um, of course, landlord hears about this, reaches out, not very happy. I'm sure he wasn't. i sure he was definitely not. <laughs> um, and then I got somewhere in the neighborhood about 250 of the um, unit owners saying, we'd love to just turn it over to you. Now, Jeez. some people, because of my letter, did actually close on the units. Wow. So now I'm sitting on 250 units. Now, here's what's really important to understand. It was a poker game. If the landlord or the owner had said, then buy them all, yeah. I'd have been screwed. I had to walk away. But timing and leverage is everything. And so we went back and forth and finally like, listen, what do you want here to just go away? Mm. And I said, well, I think you're, I think, because they didn't know that I was in the room. I think you're going to make about 140, 150,000 on each. So why don't we just call it about $20,000 per unit and I'll go away. And they agreed. And so it's $70 and some goddamn persistence. I made $5 million in just under a month. Where did this even come from? I think that's what, you know, the, the bigger question needs to be asked here because these people have been doing this for a minute. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, obviously, there's a lot of things on the table. Obviously, this wasn't even a thought. Mm -hmm. How does this 22-year-old young whippersnapper, obviously sharp, 
Yep. You know, slightly good looking. Yeah, don't let's not lie to the <laughs> let's not lie to the viewers. Not a face for radio, but come on. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Um, you know, where did this come from? Where did the, where did you even even pursue this path of finding this little gem? Yeah. Well, I, I would say it started at five years old. So that that hunger, that desire to create something out of nothing. Um, if you start leaning into that, and it's something I try to teach my daughters in every situation, don't accept anything at face value. Even if you know that it's true, explore the fact or look for another way. Say, how could I structure this? How could I do that? And, and when you start doing that, it becomes a habit. Then the habit becomes a skill. And when it's a skill, man, the world opens up. And so speed to opportunity is everything. Mm-hmm. If I had waited or if I had overthought or questioned it, I just went for it. Mm. And that's a huge thing, right? And so I've told this story so many times, and the question I always ask back, ask back is, would you have done it? Would you have seen it? Well, probably not. What if I told you, would you have still done it? Well, probably not. Why? I mean, I don't know. Something could have gone wrong. Maybe it was outside the lot. But sometimes in life, you just got to jump mm. and figure it out on the way down. And we, James and I talk about this all the time. Yeah. I'm, my motto in life is I jump out of the plane and I find the parachute on the way down. Yeah. I've got many of them same stories, you know. <laughs> of course. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am if I had not had that same mentality. Not on not on everything, of course. Sure. You know, sometimes I'm jumping out of the plane with a parachute. Of course. I'm not pulling the cord until the last minute, but nonetheless. Um, but most of the stories that got me, especially when I was young mm-hmm. and single and hungry, yeah. uh, there was nothing but, there was no loss, There's you know. No, there, was, right. there was either a yes or a no, that's right. but there was an answer. That's right. Um, but again, you kind of still not answered where did that come from in that particular case? Because listen, you, you obviously done a lot of research, but like, was this just staring in your face or was this something that kind of, that you, uh, as it just presented itself? I don't know. I mean, I mean, you could argue, you know, was it luck or was it, uh, you know, in preparation meets opportunity. The truth of the matter is I was in a room with people far wealthier than me. They were talking about how to become wealthier than they currently were. Mm. And I recognized one thing. There's opportunity here. Mm-hmm. And so when you have that, so many people just go, eh, they're just going to get richer. Mm-hmm. I say, hold on. If they can get wealthier, so can I. And I, and I, and I figure it out. And I, I did research for 30 minutes, and I honestly could have been wrong. What really locked in is one of the people that assigned me it sent me their lease. They all had an option to buy because the person that owned it originally there we go. was an older, older owner, and he wanted to take care of everybody, and he knew someday he would sell it. So on the details. So you see, so you read somebody's lease and you've seen the details. Mm-hmm. That's what I was trying to get at. Because but I sent them because I, uh, 20 years ago, historically speaking, and I wouldn't even know if, the law, if it would have held up, but you had first right of refusal. And so I just went on that. Was I mm-hmm. right? Was I wrong? It was going to cost me 70 bucks. Who cares? Yeah, wow. Who cares? And talk about being in, uh, like you said, the right place at the right time. Or maybe you created that opportunity of course because I did. you're on a ride along. I searched them out. It was it was a pull in, hey, we got spare time to pull in here and, and, and check this apartment complex out and there it goes. An opportunity presented right. itself. Did these guys ever know that this went on, by the way? Absolutely. They did. We're still friends. They celebrate it. They tell the they story all the time. Me. And better than that, the large real estate group that I did that with, yeah. about four years later, and now in three different deals, have pulled me in to consult on deals. Come on. They were so blown away by it. Now it took them a, a little. Story. It took a little bit of time for them to go over the heartburn <laughs> of having to write me a goddamn check. Yeah, but yeah, after yeah. that, they came back and they're like, "Hey, we're working yeah. on this deal. Like, what do you think about it?" So you had this, you know. Obviously, you you grew this. You had this big chunk of change. Twenty two years old. Yep. How how hard was it for you not to get distracted? Now you've got this. You know, twenty two years old. One million dollars is a lot. There you go. Five million. You can do whatever the fuck you want. Quite go more than that different. at that time. Wow. There we go. So. How, how was it not so much of a distraction to now be like, you know, I'm set, I can go and chase this, I can do this. You know, where did that sort of dedication and that discipline to home in, to, you know, double down and, and see more venture, uh, more opportunity in, in that time frame without getting distracted in the sauce? Well, I guess the answer is, for me, I just looked at it as seed money. It's like now I can really do damage because to that point I had become a millionaire mm. but I was fighting and scratching at zero money, zero capital. I just had an ignorant, delusional belief in myself which got me to a really good place. Now, not only did I have some seed money, now I had living proof that I could perform at a high level against guys that treated me like I was a piece of shit and I owned them. And so now I had money 
drive and confidence, which is ungoddamn stoppable. Yeah. Also, you had a, in, uh, a humble upbringing, which I think is cement seven and all together. Everything. Yeah. So, Everything. So what was the what was the biggest move then from there to kind of that that capitalized you? Oh, sorry. You know, catapulted you. Sorry. Into the into the next. Yeah. So then I started investing money, mm. um, meaningful money into companies. Um, had a bunch of, you know, smaller wins. I say small. It's just disrespectful to say that. 500,000, a million. Really good wins. Oh, so small. Ah, so small. Right? Just slap me in the face. <laughs> That's a stupid-ass statement. I had some really good wins. You're super humble, my <laughs> man. I, wanna, I want all hey. the viewers to know that there's probably n- nobody that's more humble than you that has been in here in the last, you know, last... One hour. Well, I pre- that's our <laughs> greatest guy. Wait, wait, last, how long have you been going there? 15 minutes? No, I, seriously, you bit. are super humble. I love it. And that's why we connect. But uh, it's uh, not the segue from your story, sorry. Uh, okay, so um, then uh, the inevitable came. Confidence was high, almost cocky. And you know what happens when you get cocky? You get kicked in the mm-hmm. face. And so here it comes. A uh, company came to me and said, we'd like to borrow $500,000. I said, short term, I'll give it to you at 20% interest. They said, done. Pay me back after four months. So I made $100,000 in four months. About 10 days later, they said, you know what? We, now we need a million dollars. Here it comes. Gave them the million dollars. 20% in three months. So I made $200,000. Uh, a little time goes by, and they ask for a million eight. I couldn't write that check fast enough. Gone. Come on. Gone. So it took me for $1.8 million. Gone. Was, go, gone. Gone. Uh, so I got the attorneys involved, um, fought for about four or five months. Attorney came to me and said, D, uh, he's been my attorney now 20 years. Um, I'll, keep ta- I'll keep spending your money, but the, the money is gone. Is it gone? No, but you're never going to find it. And so I said, okay. Now, important part. During that time, they had hired my company to build a small fitness center attached to an organic grocery store. Maybe 7,000 square feet. I equipped it. I designed it. I did all the marketing, did everything. And so I said, okay, um, I'm going to take the assets of that small fitness center, relieve $400,000 worth of debt, take ownership of the 600 members and you know $300,000 in equipment, and write off the rest. I had no choice. People say write it off like it's not a big deal. It still hurts. <laughs> um, but what I'm really good at is um, when someone – puts me down or when I have a loss, it is fuel for a fire you can't even imagine. Or maybe you can. Um, and so people say to me, you know, I built a very large gym train, uh, gym chain and had a large exit. And they say, well, how did that start? It started out of spite. Absolute spite. So I took that. I built the first around-the-clock fitness literally across the street. You could take a football and hit the building because I wanted them, the, the landlord to see what I was doing. Um, and so I built the first around the clock fitness in Cape Coral, Florida, um, year one, it was a massive success and I didn't want to own anything. I never wanted to own businesses. I wanted to arbitrage, uh, invest and get out. But I poured my soul into this company with an obsessive just desire for it to be the best. Um, and it was at least in that area. And so in short, in short order, um, we ended up by 18 months, we had about 12,000 members. 12,000. For context, that's like wow. three LA fitnesses. Yeah, that's massive. Yes. And so we started doing, we were profiting about 2.8 to 3 million a year in profit out of one gym in Cape Coral, Florida. And gross, oh, wow. Yeah, gross was 8 million, 7.5 million. Um, but big gym, 30, mm-hmm. 35,000 square feet. And so I had that one gym, ran it really well for probably six or seven years. Again, I didn't, I'm doing all the other things I'm doing, investing and growing mm-hmm. the companies and building. And everyone's like, you got to build more. So I'm an all or nothing guy. It's mm-hmm. either I'm not doing it or a million miles an hour with my hair on fire. And I said, okay, let's go. So then we built five more around the clock fitnesses uh, in about a five year period, four and a half year period, stabilized it and sold it for 52 million. Incredible. Yeah. And that was three months before COVID that we sold it. Yeah. And we kind of touched base after that. But um, with with the the building of the gym, how active of a participant in the day-to-day were you in the gym? First five years, I was there every single day, 12 to 14 hours a day. While I was still doing my other things, I was fanatically obsessed. Because what happened was... 
business crossed paths with my greatest passion and love in life, which was fitness. And so it was a beautiful opportunity for me to marry those two things together. And I don't know that I intended it, but I poured every inch of my soul into that business from a customer experience standpoint, from a, I mean, just everything was just locked in. Mm -hmm. Um, And I treated my people like they were family, like you do here. And that stuff makes a difference. No question. And we just destroyed everyone. We absolutely destroyed LA Fitness, who was the biggest player. Um, and yeah, things just went just went kind of crazy from there. Yeah, it's building the culture, right? You 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 hundred percent. The gym's a gym. Yeah. Every would say, uh, I got a membership. No. That's any other gym. Mm-hmm. And we've spoken about this. Yep. It, it's creating a culture, it's creating a, like a, a family element extension of somebody else's family people come in here well my staff for example my, my staff come in here on the days off they're yes. hanging at the front and i sit back and i think to myself wow yeah. we're doing something special on my staff are you more than me hanging out on the clock off the clock yeah there's there's uh members that are coming in here that are showing their mom and dad are the place when they're in town i yeah. mean listen th- this this has become much bigger than I ever thought, but I still had a big vision for something. And obviously, I know you had a big visionary too. But when you got into the gym business, was that more of an excuse for you to have the gym and be the bodybuilder that you wanted to be as well? Or was that kind of uh, a passion that you kind of married? Well, I, well with all, with, uh, maybe it, you've experienced this, maybe not. You know, the more I got into the gym working, the less I actually worked out. <laughs> like, it's fucking it's, true. It's so true. Like, you think... Uh, I'm uh, looking at the cameras now. Like, I'm like, oh, my like, God. Like, going into it, I'm like, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to be there working. I'm going to work. And it just didn't... I'm going to win the Olympia. That way. Um, but listen, uh, you know, maybe some people won't admit it. Did I have dreams of being Flex Lewis? You're goddamn right I did. Um, Five foot six? Well, maybe a six one version, but sexy accent, ginger beard. I mean, I'm not competing with the sexiness. I mean, that that beard. <laughs> Come listen, on, that ac- that accent. Look at if this, I bro. had that accent, ooh, hold, man, hold, hold me in on this, Tyus. The, the world. Look at this. Look at this. Be in trouble. <laughs> okay, enough, Tyus. Too much. Sulanda style. <laughs> I don't even know what we're talking about now. <laughs> Welcome to my podcast. I'm a little man. hot under the collar oh, here. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, we're talking about making a shit ton of money and being hey. bodybuilders. No, um, but but the bodybuilding element, uh, I, I do want to kind of talk about this because OFC fans, uh, uh, this is a big bodybuilding podcast. Yeah. Also business, also motivation. And yeah. I, I want to make sure that as loose as this is compared yeah. to other podcasts, you know, it's two friends talking. But there's a, there's a serious element to all this. And, I, and what I want to convey for the fans is this is, again, I've said this already in the beginning. This is not something that you was given on a silver spoon. Oh, this, this is something that you have truly earned every dollar with morally, with integrity. But yep. yet, you know, there's a nit factor to you. you. You are born with something that sees past, you know, the bullshit. You see opportunity in things. You see... You know, you play the long game. I see this with with a lot of your relationships, a lot of business partners that are mutual friends of ours. There's not one person that I've been in the room with that when your name gets brought up, say anything nice. But no, I'm God, well, I assume <laughs> no, that's what you were going to say. No, they all say nothing but great things. And in fact, the majority, um, the majority of them do business with you. That's fair. You do a lot of different businesses in a lot of different sectors. I do. Um, all the way from, you know, plumbing. Whatever. All the way to VC stuff on the right. multi-million dollar basis. Yeah. So, you know, what is probably a sector that you most love investing in? Or is it just something that you, you love to throw a little bit of dabbling in anything? Yeah. And, and who is the people that you most like to go into business? Kind of a two-part. Okay. First, thank you for probably the greatest compliment you could possibly give me. Um and honestly, I'm going to give you a compliment back because I don't know, a lot of people don't know the flex that I know. You are, without a doubt, one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. And there is not a room that I've ever been in that everyone didn't celebrate you. And that's got nothing to do with bodybuilding, by the Thank way. Thank you, bro. Yeah. Speak to a couple of my ex-girlfriends, by the way. <laughs> well, I'm not, don't include mine either. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so for me, because of where I came up, listen, I didn't go to college. I went to college for 60 days and I quit. Wasn't Gee, for me. really? 60 days in and out. Yep. I sat in a, a, a preliminary business class with a professor who was preaching to these kids, me being a kid, but a highly successful kid at that time, making mid six figures that 
everything he was telling these kids was absolutely wrong. It was going to lead them down a path of failure. Don't commit to one thing. Um, don't take risk. I'm like, okay, listen, no disrespect to professors, but if you were great at business, you'd be doing business. We, we were like adopted, man. So <laughs> we've split a birth. That's who I am. Right. So, same, and, same thing. and that's important too. If you're looking for advice, get it from someone that's done it. I'm not saying it's me or you, but look for someone that has had real world experience. Um, okay. So for, as far as investing, because of that, because I didn't go to college and get my MBA, MBAs work for me now. Um, I invest in, I, I, I love, I love business. And so I am not an expert in anything, but I know a little about a lot, which makes me lethal. And the, the path of that in any opportunity allows me to see opportunity because I know just enough about each part, each niche, each business mm. that I can, I can add just enough to pull enough to see that angle. And so I talked about this on a podcast recently. I am a big vision guy. I see the chessboard. I move them around. I surround myself with people that are far smarter than me. And it makes me look superhuman, but I'm just standing on the backs of people that are far, far, far smarter than me. And so, um, and, and a lot of people do that. But what I think I'm really good at doing is, A, recognizing and telling other people that it's not all me. In fact, in a lot of cases, in some of my biggest successes, at the end of the day, I was so unimportant on a day-to-day basis, it was everyone else that made that shit happen. Um, and I think you need to lead with that. And when you do, what happens with your people is they don't become your employees. They become your people. Mm-hmm. They, they're your goddamn army side by side. And that's how you take stuff to the next level. So many people out there, and listen, you can have success by yourself. You can have success being an asshole. But I promise you, because earlier in my career, I flirted with this idea of I needed to be a tyrant. And it didn't suit me. And I only did it because of stupid ass movies and these people on, you know, whatever, talking about how you have to be an asshole. Guess what? You don't. You can be an amazing human being and you can uplift other people and be successful together. And that's the shit that makes a lifelong of success versus a short term period of time. Mm. I, I love that. And I was going to say, too, can you can you play uh, the violin? Uh, I don't think can so. Can you play the, the flute? Uh, where are we going? I'm saying that the other, <laughs> but but the experts are what they do. But oh. they all need oh, there you go. a conductor to put everything right. together. That's right. And you are the conductor. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, for because sure. Because the conductor, no matter what you say, there there needs somebody to be a point. Yep. To control the music, the the, yep. the you know, to forever keep the tempo or slow it down. That's right. And that's you, my friend. You know, and I've seen that in in many of our relationships with many of our friends. You know, whether you're an expert in that field or not, you know, everybody does turn to you for all that advice at the end of the day, whether you have all the answers or not. That's, I think you always do, but. Yeah, that's a stretch. But again, I. I, 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 Ask my. Ask Chandra. I don't don't have all the answers. If we're bringing our girls (laughs) into this too, we won't because, you know. I love you, Chandra. (laughs) I love you too, Ali. (laughs) Our girls are friends too. Yeah, but. Going off the point though, but yeah. but but still on it. There's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there, and that's one of the reasons why I I I kind of want these podcasts to get into the ears of the the next generation of aspiring athletes and bodybuilders and stuff. Because for me, listen, we got got kind of put into a box as a bodybuilder. You kind of kind of you know put put the cliche dumbass tag on you and stuff like that's that. Right. And listen, if as a bodybuilder, there's nobody more committed and dedicated. In any other sport, I agree. Than somebody that's doing something in our world, the dedication to an end destination through ups and downs and everything else between them that's entrepreneurship. Oh my god, I don't think a, a bodybuilder would make the best entrepreneur out of anyone I've ever met. And honestly, I attribute that to a lot of my success. But let's, let's switch it out. So you that. have weightlifting, you have diet, you have all of these things, which are laser focused on in a way that most people can't even understand that level of commitment. Mm. If you take that and apply that to scaling, marketing, um, your people in the same veracity that you do bodybuilding, mm. it's game over. No one can compete. And so for me, any athlete, bodybuilder, power lifter, even if they haven't been ultra successful like you, there's something inside of them that is dangerous and valuable. Yeah, no question. And again, I think that's a, a lot of bodybuilders don't kind of have, you know, that partner back to, to realize that. Mm-hmm. I mean, with, with this podcast, I've had a lot of comments, man. I know we're going to have it from this. Sure. Um, 
there has to be somebody flying the flag from the front and, and kind of saying, like, listen, what you're doing right now can transition into things in life. That's it. Um, but because they're so kind of tunnel focused on the next chicken breast meal and whatever <laughs> else, they don't see anything past that. And um, again, you, a lot of these athletes, they need to start investing, you know, when there's a time to invest, not buy enough, you know, a pair of rims for their car and right. stuff like that. We've kind of all the cliche stuff. But of course. what advice would you give to a bodybuilder now that is kind of coming into his own, a little bit of pocket money? What would be the first thing? If you were in the shoes now of some of these athletes, what advice would you give them? I don't like the word mentor, but for lack of a better description, um, find someone that you trust. And so um, find someone with some experience. And look, there are a lot of people out there with a lot of success and a lot of experience, but you can tell really quickly if they're giving you advice from a point of they want to take something from you mm-hmm. versus I've got nothing, uh, in, I've no skin in this game, I don't take anything from this, um, and really start pouring into that person or listen, if there's not a person in your life, um, there are a lot of value, but there's a lot of valuable information, whether it's a podcast or someone, you know, that type of stuff, mindset shift. Um, but I think taking at least a portion of that energy that you're pouring into something that even if you reach the pinnacle of that sport, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, body, at some point that is going to end because we all get older. And mm-hmm. so I think carving out some time for what comes next um, before it's upon you. you so it's, it's preparation for what's next, right? Mm-hmm. Especially when you're young, it's so hard to see what's next, which is one of the things I was really good at. And I think I attribute to my success was I was always looking forward. And so I think that's an important part of it. Yeah. So a question also that I get, a, get asked because, you know, injuries and stuff like that. So say an athlete got injured. Yeah. Um, how would they rebuild from that? How would you kind of address, say, an injury, they have time for reflection? Would you then look at, at obviously, the best investment is in yourself, don't mm-hmm. get me wrong, but how hard would it be for somebody then to rebuild themselves to get back up and, and, and then start thinking why the scale on the business element of things? Does that make sense? Or do I need to readdress my question? Uh, I think so. I'll start, okay. and then I'm going to attribute it to 2019 for me. And so 2019, I had just had a massive exit, had more money in the bank that I should, that any man should ever have. Mm-hmm. Um, going through a divorce, uh, COVID had hit. And so here I am, everyone would look at me and say, that's the luckiest man in the world. Um, I'm in a massive home by myself, bunch of money, absolutely goddamn miserable, and I hate my life. Mm-hmm. Now, no one knew that. Because from the burden of leadership standpoint, I don't have the luxury of being able to share that with many people. But it's important because and it's, there's a parallel, right? Yes. And so what I recognize is I needed, to, I needed to burn myself to the ground. And luckily, COVID saved my life. I had a year to rebuild everything. So I, I sat in kind of in reflection of what had gotten me there. And I just systematically took accountability for the failures, whether it was why I was unhappy in business, why, why did my marriage fail, all of these things. So I think accountability from that standpoint, an injury might be a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. But I think the, the positive mindset of, you know, listen, any level of success, whether it's athletics or financial, you have inside of you whatever it takes to be successful. And any bad thing that happens to you, for me, I lean into it in a really meaningful way. I follow the cracks to what got me there, and I take ownership for it. Mm. And so that has always kind of propelled me forward. So, look, I, I've never been a high-end athlete, so I'm just trying to kind of correlate between having a massive injury. And so I would imagine I'm a, if I'm a, I'm a famous athlete and I feel like everything that has just been taken from me in one false swoop, I think – Really, you need to lean into a healthy mentality and really, because your body's going to heal the way that it heals. Yeah. And, and as an athlete, you know what to do to heal your body. But mm-hmm. I think what cripples people is the, the mental aspect of it. Yeah, there's a, what I've tried, I should have more clarity at the question, but um, thank you for answering that. What I meant was, um, there's obviously correlation between business and, and, and uh, being a high level athlete. Sure. So, you know, if you was to lose everything in business, which you uh, you kind of have, right? Had a massive loss just a couple of years ago. And then the same thing if as an athlete, that would yeah. be maybe a, an injury would be the same thing, losing everything, right? Yep. It, it's the mentality to the rebuild. Mm. Um, what would be the first steps for you that kind of correlates the business and the athlete kind of mindset of rebuilding? Um, so for me, I, I think it's reinvention. I think, you know, sometimes you have to let go of what you thought you'd never lose. And that's just a part of life. Mm. 
And so it's not about giving up on the past or the dream, but acknowledging the fact that nothing is forever and nothing is everything. Success, is, success doesn't last forever. Failure doesn't last forever. And so I'm really good at reinventing myself on a reoccurring basis. And sometimes I do it because I get stale. And sometimes I do it because I've had a massive loss, which we talked about in yeah. 2020. I lost over $20 million. <laughs> and so I think reinvention and not holding on to any one thing as your identity. Mm -hmm. Because if you do and you lose that one thing, then you're lost. Can, can money buy you happiness? Oh, God, no. As I just told you, I, know. I had more money I than you can imagine. I was miserable. Absolutely. Sure does make things a lot easier, and it can feel disingenuous to someone listening to like that guy. He's got more money. than So I'm not saying that I wasn't incredibly appreciative for what I had. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying you can be really rich and not have many problems and still have a massive hole in yourself that can't be filled by any amount of money. Mm -hmm. And so until you address that, you're never going to be your best self, and if you're not your best self, you can never be your best at anything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Would you say you're the happiest right now because you kind of found your flow in life and you've lost enough to, to get back up on the horse and really appreciate it more than ever? I am the happiest I've ever been in my life, and that's not a function of the amount of money, but ironically, I'm making more money now because of it. Or maybe not ironically, maybe of course, right? Of course. Yeah. And what all, also I'm doing, I've got this new mantra, which is no agenda, which I've never had. Mm -hmm. I have no agenda with anyone that I meet. I, you know, before I was always like, I'm going to find that angle. I'm going to make some money. I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And I did it in a good way. Yeah. But it was my motivating factor. Now, because I'm not, and I'm just pouring everything into the people that I meet that deserve it, guess what? Big surprise. I'm getting it back. Mm -hmm. And I'm surrounded by a quality of human being higher, maybe, not to say I haven't been had good people around me, but higher than I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And it's not a surprise because I'm being a better human too. Mm -hmm. And with that said, so what are you working on now? And what are you working on next? So that the, you can talk about. I can talk about anything. Right, here we go. <laughs> I talk about anything. Uh, we talked about reinvention. And so, you know, for the past, up until about a year and a half ago, social media was foreign to me. Not foreign, but I would have said to you a year and a half ago, which I wouldn't have been on your pod because I would have never met you. Um, I'm not a social media guy. I don't need it. Yeah, we use it for our business, but I'm not going to do it. Says the guy who has one million followers. Uh, well, <laughs> we're going to get into that. And so I, I essentially stumbled into it. We talked about that yep. two-day, $15 million thing. And so it stumbled me into social media, and it got my attention. Um, and then I started to really evaluate things for people that I've done deals with or I had really given advice who were on social media regurgitating the stuff that I said. And I said, you know what? Maybe I just need to, despite my... You know, looks, turn the camera around and um, and start just really just being me and giving and see what happens. Mm -hmm. and, and for the first 90 days, I've told the story. I was petrified. I woke up every morning in a sweat. I'm going I'm to ruin my reputation. What am I going to do? I wow. posted my first video. Everyone told me I was a piece of shit. Really? You're stupid. Absolutely. Come on. But I'm, I have conviction. Yeah. And so once I start something, I'm either going to, I'm either going to fail miserably or it's going to be a massive success. Falling sod. So I, so I just, I put my head down. I hired a great uh, head of media. James was behind me shaking his head. Of course, I'm great. Um, he's, and, he's not, bro. He's shaking his head. <laughs> shaking his head. He's like, he's like, <laughs> he's like I hate this he job. He actually asked me if I could hire him after this, before the podcast. Done. But it's okay. This is, James, we'll talk after 20. Carry on, Derek. <laughs> you can't afford him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so then uh, yeah and then and so i started meeting great people and the, so the answer to, I, listen i i am so happy flex um and a bit the biggest part of that is new relationships like this yeah. you know what i mean yeah and so yeah money is great money does solve all, solve almost every problem except for the biggest one that lies within you yeah and that's that's the one you gotta look at in the mirror every that's day right. i mean I, i've i've had my fair shares and ups and downs and um, you know, with uh, with where I am at right now, I would say I'm probably the happiest I've been. Yeah. Um, you know, people say, "Well, what about when you won this and when that?" But I was a different guy. I That's was, right. I was so focused, and yep. I was in my own lane. Yeah. Now I'm in a little bit of everybody's. I like to share my my success as much as I can, and I also love to give back as much as I can now. And kind of, as I'm not with the blinkers on, you know, with yeah. with uh, with the body Berlin, um, I get to. I get to be part of a lot of different cool things now that unfortunately, you know, as disciplined as I was going for these titles, I'm now able to do events. That's right. Keynote speaking, you know, 
have a couple of little extra drinks with my boy Derek when he comes Oof, into town. That's happening Saturday, uh, baby. Yeah, we, well, this podcast <laughs> is going out after the fact. Otherwise, you'd have people looking for us. <laughs> Thank right. God it's not live. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but that that's now what, what I'm able to do now in, in life. And I think these new opportunities that I weren't able to do in, yeah. of old, you know, the social stuff, which yep. is a massive part it's so much. Um, of entrepreneurship. You know, again, it's networking, it's it's handshaking, it's being in the connective circles of, yeah. hey, again, I had, I've had i got somebody in town right now. Uh, you came into the office and yeah. said, hey, you, you need to connect. I'm sure you guys know about 10, 100 people. That's right. that, uh, but that's how all these different relationships have happened, and it's from the most organic practices. That's being right. in the right place, around the right people, um, and I want to, you know, give a shout out to uh, David Meltzer. Oh my God! You know that that guy. I've said him many times. He's a true Incredible. unicorn. Um, and kind of played a part in how you and I met. You, you know, because you were here training at the gym, and um, I was driving to the gym, and I had a message from uh, Jake yeah. uh, Meltzer's uh, assistant, and shout out to Jake. I know you watch the podcast. Um, I was like Nick, one of the both. One of the both. They're one both studs. Yeah. Both Agreed. studs, Nick and Jake, and uh, they said that you were your. Mm-hmm. Actually, it was a group text, and they said you were your training at the gym. So I didn't see. It, I think because I'd filmed yes. and, and posted that I was here. Yes, and I and um, yeah, to your point, uh, and I walked in and I said, "Okay, let me find him." And we were. I was following you. I found you, and I think you were just about to buy something at the counter. And I said, "Derek," and you just looked at me like, "Huh?" <laughs> <laughs> like, how the few know? Well, I just I had am. a pre-workout, so my eyes. Yeah, really yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I said, hey, let's go and ch- chat in the office. Yeah. And, and needless to say, you lost an Uber. I did. We were chatting away. <laughs> that's right. Chatting like we'd known each other for years, and that's how the relationship, you know, kicked off. Yeah. So shout out to David Meltzer. Agreed. Such a Great human being. Such a stud and, and somebody who has connected so many people yeah. um, in business um, with zero agenda. Zero. Other than putting good Absolutely. people with good people. That's so, right. Um, you know, for for us, that that has obviously, um, you know, flourished into what it is now. And... Uh, our our wives are friends, so they can yeah. shit talk about us behind our back as they should when we're not doing uh, what we should be doing. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, so you are in Vegas. Um, is there anything that you're doing right now outside of Straight of the Lab podcast that you you can talk about? Uh, I mean, this trip or just yeah, this enjoy- trip that you're flown in for? I mean, honestly, I just came to see you, buddy. Oh, look at this guy. Maybe get a workout in, do a little pod, yeah, we have some drinks. Workout. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, pre pro- protein shakes and protein shakes. Protein there we go. Shakes. You got me. You protein got me. You got me. Um, but yeah, you, you've done. You got a podcast tomorrow, right? Yes, I have uh, Eric Warry's podcast. Okay. Yep. And just we did Value Tainment yesterday. That's right. And that's a big yep. podcast, man. Patrick David. Uh, did, it was yeah. uh, the Sauce one. All right. Okay. With uh, Adam. But it's still com- same yeah, company. Yeah, same, same company. company. Yep, big, same big, company. big company. Yep. So you know, again, I know you mentioned, and I want to speak about this because yep. this is a critical part. You went from not being on social media to growing your social media to over a million mm. million followers. I want to ask you how you done that because this can be transitioning into our sure. fan base along with um, what would be your advice to anybody who was on the cusp of of looking at their social media and, and kind of like, oh, I don't want to jump in this bandwagon. Yeah. What would that be advice be? Well, how I did it um, to this point, I, I don't really exactly know how I did it. <laughs> I mean, uh, other than really just being me. And so I, I didn't try to talk about stuff that I don't know. I really just tried to talk about things that as I was coming up, things that made me stumble, things that I dropped the ball on, things that I think are important. And so I don't, I don't care if you know that I have this car. I don't care if you know that I have a big house. What kind of you got, by the way? <laughs> well, now you're going to know. Uh, uh, so, you know, I had a flood, so I lost all the cars. <gasps> what? Well, the hurricane. I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, I, yeah. I, our whole house got de- devastated. First floor, all of our cars. So, uh, we live right on the water. Yeah. Hurricane Ian, I believe. Um, and I'm elevated up really high. So, Chandra's like, hey, we, we're, we're going to flood. And I said, listen, honey, <laughs> we're not going to flood. <laughs> and then the water came up eight feet. And, of course, now I, we're not going to flood. And then it's up 14. Anyway, so the whole bottom level of the house completely flooded. 14 feet. Uh, 18. So 14 to the window and then four feet in. And so we literally like Titanic Jack up there just down looking down at the water pouring in. Um, And so, yeah. And so, but I hear this sound. I'm like, why why do I hear the car? And it didn't even occur to me. Yeah. The car is, so the garage is filled up with water. And so my Rolls Royce, my Bentley, and the uh, Mercedes that, I, that Chandra has all completely, literally underwater, floating in the garage. 
Oh my god, my heart <laughs> sank. That's all right. So to answer the question, like, don't feel bad. Never feel bad for a guy with a Rolls Royce. That's the rule. Okay. Listen, it's earned. Uh, it's earned. It's earned. It's uh, But uh, anyway, so to answer the question, I replaced the the Rolls Royce with a new one. Uh, got a new uh, one of one Bentley, and then Chandra picked out this just crazy AMG Mercedes. You can't just skip over the 101 Bentley. What is this 101 Bentley? What, what is this? Explain this to me. It's uh, and, and don't be humble. It's it's a it's a overly expensive Bentley. <laughs> it's a GTC. Beautiful. It's a it's a beautiful ride. And so that's that's usually my go-to car and then we have uh, the Rolls-Royce Black Badge, yeah. which is a bad bad car. <laughs> oh. Um and that's I mean I actually listen, here's a, here's the thing with me with cars. I drive these things <laughs> Like, I swear to God, I probably have the record for the Rolls Royce with the most miles. Usually, you can get a Rolls Royce with like six mi- uh, six years old, 3,000 miles. Mm-hmm. Mine, six months, 12,000 miles. <laughs> Listen, if you're not going to enjoy it, what's the yeah, point in having it? Exactly. And so, for me, these are things like it's never lost on me. I will never not be that poor kid from Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. It's an asset and a liability. Yeah. And still to this day, I have moments where the top down, the wind's blown, it's beautiful. I, looked at, I look around, I'm like... I'm driving a Bentley. I was like, going to ask you about that. Yeah, man. It do doesn't happen every day, and it actually makes me sad because I do get used to the luxuries that I have. But there are these really special moments where I think back, and I'm like, and I think this is important to hear, right? Mm-hmm. It's not about – there are so many people that are so much more successful than me, but I've come a distance that, at least for my life, is so impressive. Mm-hmm. And I think people really get lost in that. I don't have what that guy has. Yeah, but how far have you come? Yeah. And when you sit in that level of pride, I think that is a key to really taking you to the next place. Or if not, you're happy. I'm more so looking at you and saying like, that must be nice. Absolutely. That must be nice. Took you how many years? Yep. And, and well, if they the, really knew the backstory of that must be nice. Sure. Well, here's the thing. It is nice. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I think, look, for me coming up, I think jealousy over things is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And it bothers me because, actually it doesn't bother me. It makes me sad. I have so many times where I'll take my rolls somewhere mm-hmm. and people will, with it, they'll scratch it up. Shut got, up. Oh, I've had people pull things off of it. Um, you know, the little ornament, the spirit of X. Yeah. I've had people like jam it down. And honestly, I feel bad for them because what they don't understand is that they could have it too. And this is the thing. Like I, I still believe regardless of my level of wealth, which who gives a shit, Anybody can have what I have. If I can get here, there's not a single goddamn person listening that cannot have what I have. And that is a goddamn fact. Mm. And so if you live in that, um, look, I, have, I actually have wealth guilt. Mm. I feel guilty that everyone can experience what I experience. Mm. And for a long time, that got me in trouble because I just gave money to everybody. You told me I, a couple yeah, of stories. I wanted everyone to feel what I felt because I was so like, okay, guys, like... I, I used to be poor and eat apples out of a goddamn tree. Like, this feels good. Like, let me help. Yeah. And so many people just aren't willing to do what it takes. And it's actually so much less than you think. Not to say that it's easy. But what I mean by that is you change your mindset. That's and it. And you take the first goddamn step. And people are like, okay, take the first step. Yeah, that's really it. Now, of course, you need to have some guidance. You need to have some direction. You need to have some goddamn persistence. But none of that doesn't matter if you don't start. Yeah. A lot of these things are breaking the molds too. Looking at the circle you're around. That's right. If you're around people who are kind of talking shit yeah. on, on something else or, you know, having that uh, short-term mindset or having a, the, the mindset. I grew up like that. I mean, I'm around that. that I was mm-hmm. around that mindset of, you know, and it's, they, they weren't even really wealthy now looking back. They were just kind of middle class. And somebody would say like, oh, right. it must be nice, you know, them. That's right. And you get caught up in that. Like, of course you do. Like kind of like, they, oh, then they become a target to be, you know, messed with. Yep. The kind it's, of situation. It's worse than that. When you do that, you make it seem unattainable for you. That's exactly it. Instead of, how did he do that? Yes. When I was poor and I used to see a Bentley, brother, when I tell you, I, I would think about that. Not with envy, but like with passion, like... For weeks, months at a time, like mm-hmm. how do I get that? What did, mm-hmm. what does that guy have that I don't have? He doesn't have anything that I don't have, and I knew that I would get it. Yeah. And, I, and I swear to God, that is like the biggest part of it. Yeah. It's how you frame things in your mind. I say this to my daughters all the time: be careful what you say to yourself because your subconscious is listening. Mm-hmm. 
we treat ourselves so poorly. We let ourselves down before anybody else. It's, it's just insane to me. Like, you know, if your boss tells you to be somewhere at 5 o'clock, you're there. If 6 a.m., you're there. But if you make a promise to yourself to go to the gym on Saturday, eh, screw it, I'll go. You're... You're treating a stranger better than you're treating yourself. Show up for yourself Preach. in a meaningful way for a period of time. That's what builds the confidence to take off. Mm-hmm. One thing I, I also want to mention is, and you met, you've you've mentioned them twice in the podcast, and I want to nobly give you the flowers for this. You're a great dad. Oh, thank you've you. raised two incredible, you know, young women. Yeah. My um, greatest accomplishment. Uh, as are my kids yeah. too. Uh, but you've also set them up mm. for success and failure. For sure. You, you, you've given them the opportunity, which I want you to talk about, sure. um, in putting their four first, first feet into business endeavors and going back to what we were talking about the trading card stuff, Yeah, kind of dealing with money, dealing with business success. Tell, tell the viewers what you've done for your daughters. So starting out really young, I because I wanted my daughters in every inch of my life, I brought them to every meeting I ever had. I remember back, you know, they're, they're scribbling in a boardroom with crayons, pretending like they're taking notes. <laughs> but they didn't understand, but it was, it was, it was getting in. Mm. And so still today, uh, if you pitch me on a business deal, I would bring it to my daughters. Hey, Mary, you know daddy's friend Flex? He has an idea for a business. Here it is. Why? I want them to hear how I think about it, wow. and then I want to challenge their thoughts on it. Love it. And so from a very young age, I'm going to say they're 14 and 16, so 10 and 12, they stopped asking for things for, for Santa Claus. They wanted their own brick and mortar. And so finally at 12 and 14, I said, okay, I've identified a business that we can buy. Here's the catch. The two locations, it's called Rita's Italian Ice, Sling and Ice. What is this? Uh, it's, a, it's an Italian ice store. Tiny, tiny, tiny. I in, mean, in Naples. Uh, one's in Fort Myers, one's in Port Charlotte. Um, you guys get out and support. Please, if you're on. in that area, please, yeah. over-support. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, I mean, 300 square feet, tiny. And so uh, there were two locations. Uh, one was making 60000 a year, one was losing. And so the deal here was you need to buy both. Mm-hmm. And once you buy both, you need to decide what to do. Dad will put up the money, and I did. I drafted, drafted loan documents that they signed. They helped me negotiate the initial lease, and then here's what they decided. They decided to close down the failing location, because they thought that it was close enough that those customers would come to the existing location. They were right. In the first year, it went from 60000 profit to $270,000 in profit. They took the assets of the closed one, found a s- small piece of real estate in Port Charlotte about 30 miles away, so essentially opened up that one for free. Mm-hmm. That one also does about 200000 plus a year now. Then they bought a mobile truck and four mobile units. This year, they'll, cl- they'll clear about $700,000 in profit. And they do the books, they do the hiring, the firing. And just so we're clear here, my children do not get the money. They get paid 10 to $12 an hour when they're working in the business or on the business. The money goes into obviously a trust for them, uh, which by the way, now they want to sell the company because they both want to now start their own companies. Why? Verbatim, dad, we don't want your money. Wow. Yes. Proud dad. I'm right. That's I, incredible. I'm man. raising lionesses. You truly are. That's right. You truly are. I mean, that, that opportunity is is incredible. I mean, at, at such a young age, and the what you gather and you get from being in various different scenarios, mm-hmm. that lesson is priceless. You can't go to you can't go to school for that. You can't pick you a cannot. book from that. That's right. Yes, you, you've got a you've got an incredible dad that can you know leverage stuff off. But what I do know off camera is. You truly want them to learn a lot of lessons. Yes, and failure comes part of that. Yes, you don't want to you don't want to dig them out of a hole. You want them to if they fall in a hole, hey, you know I could throw a ladder down, but I want you to try and find a way of that's right cutting stairs in with a little shovel, and you can get yourself out. Listen, Warren Buffett says probably the greatest statement that I've ever heard in my life when it comes to kids, and it's what I'm going to live by. Warren Buffett he has more money than anyone. I mean, and it's not the richest, but he's got billions and billions of dollars. And he said, I, I want to give my kids enough to do anything, but not so much to do nothing. And so Repeat it one more time. I want the viewers to hear this. I want to give my kids enough to do anything, but not so much they can do nothing, because that'll destroy a person. Yeah, it truly is. And uh, with your kids now and what you've just said, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they truly have, have that entrepreneurial mindset. And what they've done in that short period of time 
It's truly amazing. When you told me this when we went to dinner that one time, yeah. I was blown away <laughs> because that truly gives me inspiration and motivation to now look at Adi and you know see what she's doing. Obviously, she's going on eight, but nonetheless, right. um, she has an upbringing that I certainly did not. Exactly. So I'm very worrisome of you know the private school she's in Absolutely. and the the you know the wrong you know, sort of mindset that you can get from that. Well, um, everything that made us, we took away so our kids yeah. wouldn't have it, right? And yes. so that has been a, a huge concern as yours as well. Yeah. And so I don't know that you asked, but I'm going to answer it anyway. I was going to Because it, yeah. yeah, it was a massive concern for me is I needed to expose my daughters to the reality of life because we don't live reality. I, listen... I own the fact that I don't live in reality anymore. I earned not to live in reality anymore, but I'm so acutely aware of it and mm-hmm. at times embarrassed of it. And so I used to take my daughters to the construction site, like their kids, swing a hammer, see what it feels like to work. Mm-hmm. And so um, something we didn't talk about and I take massive pride in is I treat my employees the same across the board. You I don't, do. I don't care if you're my COO or my goddamn janitor. You're going to get the same respect. Mm-hmm. And so my daughters see that, and they have seen it. And listen, it, you can't change the fact that our children come from privilege. And there's nothing wrong with privilege. The problem with privilege is when you act like a piece of shit. And that's why my circle is so small, because my peers are horrific human beings. They treat people that serve them horribly. They... They, they stab people in the back. And so I'd rather have a circle of one or two mm-hmm. than 200 people who I'm embarrassed to be around. Yeah. And I, I to, to attest what you said, you do treat people incredibly well from, you know, the janitor all the way up to the, the CEO, CBO, whatever it is that's, that's working with you or the business partner. And what I would correlate to is having that line of funds two to three hours long, treating everyone that's right. that is standing there with the same care and attention as that I would that my sponsor. That's right. You know, or, or somebody that is, a, you know, Mr. Olympia. Mm-hmm. Because what athletes, and I want my, the, my fan base to, uh, and the followers to listen to this, and obviously what Derek said, and take heed in this, because, you know, not everybody's going to stay a fan. You know, the, the, for the guys and girls that have stood in line for me, I hope that, you know, these words come true, but I know they are. I will treat everybody how I want to be treated myself. I know what it's like to be treated shitty. Yes. Um, I also know what it's like to be put on a pedestal, but I also get embarrassed by some of these cases. So, um, you know, the the fans that have stood in line for me the two to three hours, some of them I do business with now. And they always remember that first interaction because it might be the first and it might be the last. That's right. So how you treat people will always govern the next stages of how they go off, how they post about you that's right and with this day and age this is within seconds you have one interaction flex of our soul that's right it's across the internet yep. and um with you it's the same thing you know obviously the the fan base is is exchanged with your your day-to-day people that you meet um and you're not trying to flash on flex and say i'm this guy and right. i make much mo- this much money i don't talk to you anymore because you know what it's like to be that guy on this guy my whole family was looked down upon and looked as if we were garbage. So how dare someone like me ever do that to someone else? Yeah. That's it's, right. It's, it's, um, it's one of the reasons why you are going to go on and do much more than you've ever imagined on top of what you've done. Sure. And one of the reasons why, you know, um, you and I have linked for many different reasons, but yeah. um, there's a lot of cool things that are coming down the pipeline. Right. Um things that you know me and you might be involved with too which i'd love to get you back on in the future because as i said the beginning of the podcast you know i was waiting for this one to be finished but derek was like no you gotta get me on right now so i'm coming i know i know (laughs) i'm coming i know but is there anything that you want to kind of wrap up the podcast with and talk about um anything that uh, any gems that you want to install on the fans that you haven't yet spoken about we can the floor is yours and we can continue this as long as you want but i want to make sure that you end this on your way well i, th- I want to circle back on one thing because um i'm really good at recognizing because now i'm out there talking to so many people about the thing with my daughters and so i want to really shrink that down we talked about that as we started this podcast out because there may and not in a malicious way but there could be someone out there saying well yeah okay you had $150,000 to give your daughters. So it's, it's not about that. 
Mm. And so if I take myself out of the situation, like my father, who was a mailman his whole life, if I'm, you know, I'm just making enough money to go by, which by the way, because that's my whole family, I respect it more than anything. Um, you can open up a lemonade stand with your daughters. Like, so it's not about, it's not about the size of what's being done. It's about the, it's about the effort that's being put in. And listen, that's not just about my daughters. And so what I really want people to take away from this podcast is not the size and grandeur of the success that I've had, but just the, the steps and the path that I took. Because when you, when you include the size, I think it makes people feel like they can't do it. Mm -hmm. So cut that shit out. Just talk about the fact that I came from the gutter and fought all the way because anyone that is listening can absolutely do anything that I've done. Yeah. And that, I mean, listen, <laughs> there's, there's nothing better than a success story and you are a testament to that. You do truly are. You're a testament to that success story because, as you mentioned, you know, both siblings are on vacation. On vacation. And... and you know, you, you yeah. could have fallen in that path. You could have sure. looked at that and, and said, okay, that's my future. That's, that's my, right. my destiny. And, you know, as much as you probably could have said that uh, I'm not going to go down that path, you know, you could have linked around the same people no and question. found yourself, you know, in a situation. Yep. As could have I. Well, sure. We recognized it. We knew we were much better than what we are. And for the viewers that are watching that, no matter what your age is, if you're watching this and you're 16 years old or you're 60 years old, there's... There's a button that you need to push, yeah. and I have a sign up in my office as a ticket stub that says one life, yeah. and it's true. It of is true. One life. No matter where you started, where you come from, how much money was in your bank account, mm -hmm. it's up to you to change the trajectory on your life. I agree. And um, as Ed Milet says, mm. you were the one in your life, in your generation, in your family for change, and I am the one in mine. And that means that now the future is bright for all and everyone that's coming behind us because we recognized it and we wanted to change, uh, change not only our life, but we recognize that the future that, that, and the next generations that are going to be uh, coming from your grandsons, your grand, uh, uh, granddaughters will yeah. be looking at, you know, grandpa, granddad, dad, not to put that on, great granddad, as that guy who was the one. That's right. And that's an amazing feeling. Agreed. And you truly need to sit down when you're driving your Bentley around Florida <laughs> and, tr and, and process it, man. Because oh, there's no doubt. Do that more. Yeah. Because no, you're again, right. Yeah. You're right. And, and so the last thing I'll say is there may be some people sitting there saying, but who, who, do, who do I find to talk to? And so, you know, my media team probably know what I'm about to say because they tell me I spend too much time doing this. But I actually believe that Instagram and social media can be philanthropic if handled correctly. And so what I'm going to say right now, although maybe understand it might take me some time, but if someone DMs me with a meaningful question, I will take the time to answer that question and go back and forth. And I don't want anything for it. And I'm not here to take your goddamn money. Mm. I really am taking a ton of pride uh, and enjoyment in pouring my 25 years experience into people that actually have questions. Um, and I did it the other day. I talked to somebody for probably 35 minutes and helped them solve a problem in their roofing company. Wow. And then they, and then, you know, they come back and just the, the, the hearing how it changed the landscape of their company. Um, like I, I believe now at this stage in my life, that stuff comes back. And so the answer is if you're out there and you're feeling like, well, I, I, everything is resonating with me, but who the hell do I ask this question? DM me. I don't yeah. want anything from you. There's not going to be a price and I will participate. Now it might take me two weeks to get to you because there are a lot of DMs, yeah. but I've got, you've got my word that you're going to hear from me. I'm not going to hear from my team. Well, regardless, if you don't DM him and you want to get that motivation on the day, you put on a lot of content. I you, do. You have That's been right. going from somebody who didn't like to put anything on social <laughs> yes. media. You have become quite the stud in there, my friend. Where well, I, I am sitting there and watching your stuff at yeah. uh, you know early hours of the morning, four in the, four a.m. to late at night, and I'm thinking, man, that 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 resonates. That hits me hard because you do a lot of things that yes. You look at the big numbers, they can be scary. You're talking about what That's you've right. achieved, you've done, but also you break things down That's on right. the simplistic factor too. So there's a lot of evidence for everybody Agreed. on your page. And Agreed. what is your Instagram? It's just my name, Derek Fay, D-E-R-I-K-F-A-Y. Yeah, yeah, check it out, guys. And, yeah. and not only that, um, 
Any other anything else you want to promote? Anything podcast or anything else that you've got coming up that you want to throw out to the fans or anything last parting words? No, if they're interested, you, everything is tracked really well on the social media pages. Um, again, I'm not here to sell anything, so I don't really have much to promote. Just want to come hang out with my friend and my brother and oh, talk shop, and yeah, that's it. Oh, my, my. Well, yeah. I hope that everybody that's sitting at home has uh, you know taken as much from this podcast as I have. As as always, we we try to you know on the on the show. Um, have good general chat without going, you know, talking things that go way over their head. Because for me, again, I'm I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Nor I, I hang around with the smartest guys in the room. So well, we better find know. someone for this room then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the smartest in this room for me. So sorry, Tyus and James in the back there. You know, <laughs> um, but um, it's always a pleasure, my friend. And I know that um, you know we have a great friendship, but yeah. uh, ever growing and ever being watered into. And I think that's what. I like about this. Mm. We met no MOs. There wasn't right. like, hey, let's do this. No. Yours, let's do that. Or me coming to you and saying the same thing. Yeah. We kind of uh, met with very similar mindsets. And, and um, you know, we see things very similarly Agreed. with with a moral integrity. And, and um, you know, with a... with uh, I'm, I'm trying to pick my words here. We know who the bullshit is at. There's no there doubt. And, and uh, we right. kind of, we march around them. And we, the first time we talked about pigeons for an hour. Oh, Jesus, you have to throw this out now. <laughs> Tell you, should we that, talk about pigeons that's or another, should we cut that's that out? We can talk about pigeons. He's, look, he's rolling his eyes at that. People, uh, if you do it, just to, uh, listen, I was blown away when you told me about it. I, I know we were wrapping it up, so we can do, that could be part two. Pigeons it, it, part there's two. There's no question. I'll leave this the, the cliffhanger. I want everybody to pull their phones out right now when we end this podcast and type in world's most expensive pigeons. Oh, there we go. And then we leave it right there. <laughs> Straight out the lab with my main man, Derek Faye. We're going to be coming part two, and then we'll kind of uh, break some news on the second one. Love it. My Thanks. man. Thanks for having me, Let's brother. Let's go. Out.